On this episode of Earth Focus, lessons learned during Hurricane Katrina are being put to the test along the coast of Louisiana. Some predict New Orleans will be submerged by the end of this century. The region's survival depends on its ability to adapt to climate change. If successful, Louisiana may provide a blueprint for others around the world. There were families here. There were kids in the street playing football, right? There were, uh, there were neighbors. This house was the candy lady. As kids, we would come down and spend our quarters and sit here on this porch and eat it and just enjoy the atmosphere of, of the community, right? And that went away it's just overnight. It just got washed away. We are seeing scenes like this one throughout the city. Do you remember if you told him that the levees had broken? I don't recall specifically, but it was that like New Orleans is flooding. No. Sit. Knocked over them plants on their porch last night, huh? Missy, is some upset with you. A couple months ago, we had a rainstorm. Just an ordinary rainstorm in southeast Louisiana. It was one of those days that we thought, hey, just a little rain. But lo and behold, the city flooded. The drainage system was not up to par. We loved hurricanes as kids. I remember when the calm came, we would play out in the water. It was just another day off from school, right? But now, uh, it's, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. This is not a hoax, this is real. Climate change is real. So how do we live with it? I think in this section of town, we start to understand that water and climate change goes hand in hand. New Orleans, in the last five to seven years, has really taken on a great adaptation of climate resilience and climate change. Elevation is one of the major adaptations that you sometimes see is that the houses are raised higher. This is the Center for Sustainable Engagement and Development. We have rain gardens here. We help communities how to build rain gardens. We also have a orchard. You see over here, we have lemons. Here's one of here. After Katrina, you had all these toxins from the water. So that went into the soil, and that's all over the Lower Ninth Ward, and probably a lot in Louisiana. Evidently, the process of going through the trees to bear fruit, it doesn't come into the fruit. Also, we recommend above bed gardens where you can put fresh soil to give you crops that are not tainted with that point. What we've tried to do is help with the community to first educate them because they get confused about, you know, is climate change a political issue? Is it real? We just try to give them the facts. Then we try to show how they can be advocates for how we adapt to that climate. If we don't do something, all this beauty of New Orleans that everybody loves, tourists come down and see, they'll be looking at just water. That's it.
plan we've relied on believes that we can fight water. And if you've ever been to a beach when there's a riptide and you think you can fight water, you will learn that you will lose that battle. With a climate adaptation plan, you have a wet system and a dry system. So when you need to lift water out, you can do that. But when you need to let water in, you can let the water in through that system into these canals and circulate it around the city. I mean, some people might walk past here and think, oh yeah, it's just overgrown grass. No, it's a low-lying area that has certain vegetation in it that is the perfect vegetation when you want water to absorb and be able to dissipate at a more gradual rate. I mean, it doesn't look like a lot of natural science, but there's a lot of natural science that goes into it. It costs less to have green infrastructure because this is low maintenance. This is a model of a part of the city of the main drainage basin. You have an underground system, the white lines under the earth. The idea was to get the water into these pipes, you get that water to these pumps, and you just push it out. That was the method. The truth of the matter is, there is no way to solve our water issues with just our pumps and turbines. It's not enough. It will never be enough. You know, decades of doing the wrong thing usually kill you. We got our death warning in you know, 2005. If there was a political will to make sure that this, this city sees another 300 years, it would mean having very beautiful, very aesthetic blue ways along with green ways throughout the city us living with water so that when that next storm comes, because it's going to come, that's a fact, that water has a place to go other than your cars and your homes and the streets. At some point after Hurricane Katrina, people started to get really serious about coastal issues. And they started to think about risk reduction, protecting people from flooding, together with restoration as one thing that needed to be addressed. And so we came up with this coastal master plan, which is a list of projects that have been scientifically vetted. And so we have projects that dredge material from one place and put it in another place to actually build new marshes where there's open water at the moment. On the risk reduction side, we have extensive series of levees and floodgates around some critical coastal communities. These are projects that we think will work. Not work now, but work into the future. This is Skyline 5478 November. The state's coastal master plan is a $50 billion, 50-year plan. I consider myself an oceanographer and a coastal geologist, so I look at issues like why we sink in Louisiana, and I also look at issues like how we rebuild coastal landscape. The barrier islands are one of the first lines of defense against a storm, right? So notice how this is now pretty much continuous. There's no channels in the middle of it. Uh, this is an example of a, of a restored barrier island. All right, and then you can see New Orleans. So that's one of the major post-Katrina levee improvements. So the idea was to basically wall off this area to prevent a storm surge from getting to the lower ninth ward. Levees are sometimes built with earth and sometimes they're built with concrete, but the core point is that they are all a wall that protects an area from waves and rising waters from, from a storm. The biggest variable in this is sea level rise. If the sea level rise rates are at the low end of the spectrum of what people predict, then you could rebuild large areas of the landscape and provide flood protection for a lot of people. If rates are at the high end, then I think a lot of areas will be lost, even with the state's best efforts. Well, welcome to Coca Tree. 
The master plan needs a lot of inputs, and so the kind of work that I do feeds into the parameters that the state needs as part of its master plan. So, you know, I just wanted to give you a view of, of what the salt marshes around here look like. You can see that there's marsh for, for miles in that direction. Marshes provide a lot of buffer from storm energy. So they're a buffer between our human civilization and, and the sea. So the restoration involves pumping sediment into a marsh like this to raise the elevation, to allow it to better keep pace with sea level rise and to fill in areas that have, that have eroded. So this is the Bubba Dove structure, which is one of the major floodgates in the Morganza to the Gulf levee system. With a levee, one question that you have is who's inside and who is outside the levee system. By drawing this wall in the marsh, you're changing the environment, but you're also setting down a series of principles of who lives where and the kinds of choices that these communities face in the years ahead, some of which are going to be very, very tough choices. This here used to be Lover's Lane, because there were trees all over the place. You can get in here and, and go hide back there. So we listen to music and, and hang out with the girlfriend. Don't know mind if I say that, huh? All right. I was born and raised right here. In the tall grass right here. I guess they represent where all of my ancestors uh, was born and raised and died, and a lot was buried over here as well. So to me, it means a whole bunch. The land is important to us because it's where our ancestors settled. That's where our family is at. That's where our, the heart of who we are is. It's a space that we become one with. The, the Indians were in the way of the white man. So they always sign treaties for more land and more land, and that's how we got to over here. The government chased us. So we settled over here and was happy, and now Mother Nature is, is getting us away. This is my grandparents on my mother's side, my grandmother and my grandfather right there. I was raised here my whole life, <laughs> yes. Isla Jean Charles uh, has always been a, a wonderful place to live. The island then actually opened up to the world fully, not until about the early 50s when our road was built. It was very easy to wake up in the morning and see armadillo in the yard or possum or raccoon, uh, you know, crossing the yard or whatever, whatnot. All that has changed because with a lot of it just being water now, the trees have died off. What you're seeing is actually just a skeleton of what it used to be, you know? To me, it means uh, almost, I guess you could say like a, a family member uh, having cancer, you know, it's being eaten away, you know, it's just, a little bit by little bit getting destroyed. You know, the only thing is uh, the piece of land is, is lasting longer than the human body can.
one right here is the Northfield Canal. There's one that passes here, there's one that passes a little bit further, and there's one that passes in the back. So you're looking at uh, uh, water, or I say salt water intrusion coming from the pipeline canals and they destroy the vegetation that we used to have. But you know, most of the people work for the oil company. They're the one that's putting food and paying rent and mortgages and stuff like that. So uh, as much as you hate them, you have to like them. Ola Jean Charles is, uh, what's the common saying, the, the canary in the minefield? We see in, over here we call it relative sea level rise. You have the global sea level rise, uh, which is slight, but about 80% of the sea level rise here is because it subsided. So we both subsiding, and you have the global sea level rise at the same time. So we are sinking by, I think it's three millimeters a year. And it's not, doesn't sound like much, but you go in the 40 years, 50 years, then you start to notice differences when you already only slightly above the water, like Ologene Charles. In the beginning, it was a slow process. It was really not really noticeable, but then whenever the water started coming in even more with it, it got to be more rapid because they had more water coming in and the land didn't stand a chance. So many people on their own did make the decision to go because of the water. My dad moved off the island I want to say right before I was born because he wasn't able to get to work with the road flooding and he needed to work. But I am from the Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw Band of Isle de Jean Charles. And that's my heritage. That is my daughter's heritage. You know, that's our family legacy. Cha! <laughs> Get all the people that's gonna be named. Hurry up, the fire's gonna go up. A child was born. Everybody went and visited and brought a gift. Now, it's not happening. Thank you for today's sunrise. Hey, Don. You want an Indian name? Your name is Zilpa. The displacement really, really made a change in our culture. Now we kind of live. <laughs> like the Noni Indians, okay? <laughs> the only way these coastal communities will survive into the latter 21st century is to protect ourselves from the Gulf of Mexico. I realize in 300 years, this will probably be all open water. I mean, the sea will, will take us all over. What I'm trying to do with the levee system, what I'm trying to do is buy ourselves two or three generations. just about impossible to include them into a levy system. It would cost probably $300 million, and it would be nearly impossible because the soil conditions are so bad. You know, to build a flood protection project, you have to have more benefits than cost. One thing that's not factored in the cost, they only look at the the cost of the homes, the cost of the businesses, the, the infrastructure. But you know, I don't know how you put a price on it, but they do not consider the cost of a whole culture. As displacement keeps happening and we just further separate our community, it'll just get lost.
we learned about a National Disaster Resilience Grant competition. So um, we submitted our plans. We worked to fit with the state's master plan and um, they presented it and it got funded. Right now, um, the way relocations typically happen in the United States, we rely on, a, on an individual buyout model. And so in other words, um, someone receives some compensation to go live somewhere else. But in doing so, we do lose that cultural fabric. So we don't really know if we can move people collectively as a group cheaper and more efficiently than individually. There's very little positive in the form of resettlement of people. You know, governments just don't do it well. We presented a different model, community designed, community driven. I think that was HUD looked on that and said, let's, let's try it, let's try a pilot program. See if we can figure out how to do this on a smaller scale so we can change it for, we have so many communities in the U.S. and abroad that has, that's facing these same climate issues. And I think that's why so many people are watching because it's like, okay, can we really get this right? Because we know how important it is for the future of the world to get it right. There's a reality there that I don't like, but it's something that I have to face up to. Because you see, I had to go there and make a decision to leave a place that's always been home for seven or eight generations and that wasn't easy to, to let go of. And, and in fact, in spite of answering that question a, a few times, it still doesn't make it easy. So this is the new preferred site for the island. This is where our community is gonna move to. It's a beautiful place. To me, this is new life, new birth, a sustainable place. This is a healthy space. Now we do understand that it is a historically tribal community and we also understand that populations have left this particular location over a period of time and those are folks that if we're successful in this project will have an opportunity to reconstitute in the new location but our primary set of beneficiaries are the people living on the island. We want to pick up the people that are living in this dire scenario uh, and ensure that they live somewhere that is safe now and into the future. I hope that the tribe would own the land and actually be sort of like a mixed ownership. You know, the folks would have full rights to their land, um, but at the same time, what if they were good to go and want to move off of it, it would revert back to the tribe. So that way that land would be forever sacred for the tribe to have. We've got to walk a pretty fine line by which we're developing something that makes sense for this community, but also could be applicable to a much wider array of communities that may be in a similar situation. And we simply don't have a good answer to that question yet. I find this very empowering. It's allowing us to break down some of those cultural barriers, some of those grief barriers that's been in place from years past. You didn't even realize it. If every other hurricane season you're having to replace cars or furniture, you don't have a chance to have savings and you don't have a chance to allow your kids to have a better next step in life. Starting out in this piece of property, they can have a hope and a way to progress into the future. If I was to portray it on an endangered species list, this is our, our, our rebirth where we can start our new population to get off that endangered species list.
Earth Focus is made possible in part by the Orange County Community Foundation and the Farview Foundation.